This is a story of success. Success which comes from hard work, luck, and the drive to never give up. We're deep in the Bahamas on the island of Abaco, and we're being guided by Oliver White. It starts with a passion, a fire within, the sacrifices, the pain, the lifestyle, the dedication, the hunt, yeah, it is. the success, the reward, the satisfaction, the reason. This is Guided. Heading into the warm, shallow waters of the Bahamas to bonefish is like a waking dream. Nice! <laughs> the water is perfectly pristine, gin clear, the beaches are white and spotless, and the bone fishing is off the charts. And my guide, Oliver White, has a life story that's truly inspiring. <laughs> Oh, but this place is paradise, man. This is absolutely awesome. But you're not a Bahamian. No, no. How'd you get here? Uh, you know, I grew up in North Carolina primarily, and yeah. so I started trout fishing just like everybody who fly fishes, and it always starts with trout. Yeah. My father was career military, so we moved a lot when I was a kid. We kind of moved back to North Carolina when I was around 10, so North Carolina's always been home and uh, still is home. And then I went to college in Chapel Hill, and that, it was really in college when I really started my fly fishing career. I was going up to Western North Carolina to guide for the summers. And they had their little business there, which was small stream and, and float fishing. And then they had a business in Alaska, and they did a bone fish. There's some more fish coming. They did a bone fishing school in the Bahamas. Right. And so he asked me to come to the Bahamas. My very first trip, uh, I was 17, and I, I came to teach fly casting. The guiding wasn't really meant to be a job. I, I was so into fishing, that's where my free time was spent, and the equipment was so expensive, I actually got a job at the fly shop just to be able to get a discount and buy all the stuff I wanted. It was always pushing for the next challenge. My, my uncle's fly fish, and so as a young teenager, and I attempted fly fishing, which meant spending 90% of your time sitting on the rock, untangling your mess. <laughs> yeah. You kind of persevered through it. I, I love the place, I love being outside, and it was starting to be cool, but it also really just appealed to me. And early in life, fishing w was always part of it, but I was a big skier. And so, and I right. skied hard all winter, and um, when I was in college, I had a bad skiing accident. I was skiing fast and steep, and somebody bumped into me, and I hit a tree and went off a cliff kind of getting banged up. I broke my back and my pelvis and a bunch of things. Wow. And missed a year of college. And during that whole recovery time, I was really just stuck in bed. I mean, I had a back brace, I mean, a walker. You know, I had to learn it all over. And I can remember just being so miserable. I mean, I, I, when I was in the hospital, they're like, well, you can't leave, you're on morphine. And I was just like ripping things out. I was like, get me out of here. It was just so, so hard to be stuck in bed. Stuck at home, recovering, and I would go out outside and I would just cast my fly rod because it was one of the few things I could do. So, I mean, I'd be just totally banged up. And, and it took a long time to kind of be physically active again. But quickly, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do was get back outside. And I wasn't able to ski anymore. You know, I used to rock climb as well. Couldn't do that very well. And fishing was something where I could devote my full energy. So physically, it didn't really help with the recover, but mentally, it helped me stay grounded. I mean, a big part of my life was always being outdoors and fishing was the, the sole outlet of that. One of the m many great things about fly fishing is it requires just enough concentration to take you away from everything else, but not so much that it's taxing. So it really puts you in a great mental state. It lets you really appreciate where you are, who you're with. You're not thinking about work. You're not thinking about hurting or whatever it is. It really lets you escape and, uh, and enjoy the moment, which is hard to do. You got it. Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh. <laughs> an hour of fishing yet. <laughs> he hasn't quite figured out what to do in here yet. It's just so much fun to watch him come in hard. Just anger, anger, anger. Has to kill it. I'm going <laughs> to eat you. Skunks off the boat. 
That's good. First one's important, man. Big difference between zero and one. Yeah, you got him right in the middle. <laughs> right in the good part. Oh, those teeth are huge. Worked. Your fly. Little change. Look at that. Look at the lace he's got on top of his head. Kiss him? Yeah. Uh -huh. Once fully recovered, Oliver started guiding again. My nature is usually when I go at something, I go 100%. So I was learning everything I could, reading everything I could, going with anybody better than me, trying to get better and get better quickly. Traveling as far as Alaska and back to the Bahamas, Oliver met Fernando de las Carreras, the owner and CEO of Nervous Waters. So Nervous Waters uh, at the moment is the largest operator of fly fishing lodges in the world. And they do a, a really great job running quality programs with quality guides and taking great fisheries and putting great establishments there so that you have a great place to stay and great food. Oliver was into his guiding at that point. And Oliver wanted to, I think, just being having that adventurous spirit, um, wanted to move. Um, and he ended up moving to Argentina. So I was down in Argentina guiding a flagship operation called Cal Taupin, uh, which is down in Tierra del Fuego for sea run brown trouts. And uh, I mean, it's been named the best fishing lodge in the world. It's, it's, it's totally incredible. You know, the lifestyle I live is a dream for most people, but most people aren't willing or able to take the risk to try to make a living doing it. You know, yeah. they want to take a more traditional route and have a nine to five job and, you know, a house and a white picket fence and, and those right. things, just like all the kids I grew up with. And my thought was always that I love what I do. It's a great way to travel, but at some point I have to stop and I'll go back and I'll get a law degree or an MBA and I'll go to a more corporate career. It was guiding in Argentina, where a fishing trip would lead to a job offer of a lifetime. And this guy shows up uh, from New York, and he had never fished before. And that had never happened there. We don't get anglers like that. But he had bought this trip at a charity auction because they told him it's the best in the world. And he said, I, I'm going to try it. Might as well try it at the best. Uh, his name is Bill Ackman. You know, he ran a hedge fund in New York. He was a young guy. And I got stuck guiding him for the week. Bill. Um and he hit it off very well. And not only was he inquisitive about the fishing, but he was with me, you know. How'd you end up here? And what are you gonna do? Bill is the type of person, I think, that he's not this, he can hire all the uh, Harvard grads that he wants, but he likes to have some diversity. Bill came to me and said, you know, you're, you're a smart kid, and I think you would do really well at what I do. Uh, why don't you come work for me in New York? And Oliver was like, there's no way. I'm doing the whole guiding thing. And so he said, well, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you some books. Essays of Warren Buffett, you know, went up on Wall Street. I mean, it was all theory of how the markets work and really based in value investing, which is what Bill does. And it was intriguing. You know, I, I never studied finance and I never studied economics. And uh, I liked the books. I liked the story. I liked the guy. He uh, called Bill. It's like, Bill, you know, I read these books. I think I'd like to do that. He said, OK, come on up to New York. Coming up, a fishing guide goes to New York. While guiding in Argentina, Oliver White gets an offer from billionaire Bill Ackman to work at his New York hedge fund. You know, I mean, I took this job in New York. I'd never been to the city. Yeah. You know, I had, I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, you know, I mean, I sold my drift boat and my truck just to be able to get an apartment in New York. I thought I would go to New York expecting to learn a couple things, that I never wanted to work in an office, that I never wanted to live in a city. And even if I only went for six months and validated those thoughts, then it was worth the trip. Oliver was very successful in the hedge fund business. He was really doing a great job for Bill Ackman. Bill couldn't have been any more pleased. He would have wanted nothing more than to have Oliver with him, I'm sure, for as many, many years as he possibly could. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, counter to what I thought. I actually love New York, and I love the job. Uh, I mean, the worst part about the whole job was you had to shave every day. So, uh, I mean, the people were great. The office environment was great. I learned so much. I mean, I, you could not have paid for a better education. Um, but I really missed the lifestyle that I had prior to New York. And Fish. the balance was trying to figure out a way to make a living and have the lifestyle that I had. It, it goes totally against his nature to be out of nature. He, he's best when, when he's getting dirt under his fingernails and cleaning fish scales and going after big, big fish. 50 tried to come and eat it. Come, you're not that good, Mark. You got it, you got it. <laughs> oh! <laughs> 
<laughs> and so I went to Bill's office and I told him, I said, Bill, you know, I, I love what I do and I, I can't thank you enough for the opportunity, but I don't think that business school is necessarily right because I'm not sure that this is what I want to do. And Bill immediately pushed and, and said, that's, that's fine. So what do you want to do? You can do anything. What do you want to do? If I could figure out how to make a living and run a successful business fishing, that, that would be the perfect world. And to Bill's credit, he just said, that sounds great. If you can go figure it out, you know, I'll invest and, uh, you know, and I'll backstop it. We'll make it happen. The fishing industry, for the most part, is a very fragmented, very unsophisticated space. So if you come at it and look at it with some business acumen and look for opportunity, it exists. Look at that, man. <laughs> Coup to fly right in his mouth. <laughs> Almost as big as he is. Do you think the fishing industry is still very much in its infancy then as, uh, as, as a business? No, I mean, it's been around forever. The problem is, for most people, they do it out of passion alone. Right. And, and so that means that they take this pie that is the fishing world, they chop into a thousand pieces so they all can participate in something they're passionate about, which is really why the place is so fantastic and why there's so many great people Absolutely. in all of these things. The problem is a lot of those guys don't really understand how to run their business profitably. Oh, you got him! <laughs> I eat it on that like crazy, man. On well, that, he's not tired. <laughs> he's angry, though. So really, I took the skills I learned in New York, and now I, instead of taking the fishing skills to New York, I'm taking it the other way. And it was a, a broad search of what's available. And so the natural progression was what companies are for sale. So I mean, I looked at manufacturing companies, you know, flies, waders, rods, and they were all terrible businesses. And, uh, and then started looking at lodges, and they were all priced inappropriately. I mean, they, they might have been good places or good fishing, but they were terrible businesses, especially for what they were asking. So the only value that I saw was the ability to create something new. Oliver searched for the perfect location for a fishing lodge. And the Bahamas, I thought, was the answer for, for a lot of reasons. But one is you can fish most of the year. It's really close to the United States. And, oh, uh, so <laughs> and there, there's just opportunity to be a good operator here in an incredible fishery that is really easy to get to. <laughs> How many species are we on to today? For me, one. <laughs> and when he found a neglected hotel site? And I found a great piece of property in a perfect location on an incredible fishery. And uh, it had been for sale for a really long time. Oliver formalized a business plan and with Bill as a major investor, purchased the property and started construction of a brand new lodge. It was very run down. You know, um, this, this decking, patio decking that we are standing on, this was all tear up. We had a hurricane, had it all um, um, destroyed and stuff like that, and we, we had to renovate all of that. It was, it was a disaster. But it was during construction that Oliver experienced a horrifying day. We were in the middle of construction. It was a Saturday. You know, I had 30 people working at any given time. Everybody had just gotten off work, so the sun was going down, and nobody was here. I was here, and, and a guy shows up. Walking through the yard, and so he um, just naturally walked outside. Like, hey, how you doing? What can I help you with? You know, he was acting a little, little strange, and said he was looking for a job. Told him I didn't have any work, you know. And so they had a brief conversation about that, and um, Oliver just found that, you know, unfortunately, just didn't have anything available for the guy, and wished him well. Just wanders into the property. And I kind of wander behind him, trying to figure out what's going on. And, uh, you know, my phone rings, and, and I pace when I'm on the phone. So I answer the phone, and I'm walking around talking. And when I, when, when I hang up, you know, the guy's got a, got a machete at my neck. The guy reached down and picked up the machete, proceeded to take him hostage. What followed was a harrowing 12-hour ordeal. Oliver was beaten and hogtied and driven by the man in Oliver's SUV. The man wanted to steal money, but not before several attempts on Oliver's life. Oliver was fortunate to escape, and police captured his kidnapper much later. And it was shocking because we couldn't believe that, because, um, you know, that never happened here like that, you know? So after the whole thing went down, you know, I left. Uh, I left the country, went back home. So I went back to North Carolina, and, uh, you know, I was talking to Bill about everything that had happened, and, uh, and his advice was just to walk away. Coming up, Oliver reconsiders his future.
While constructing his dream fishing lodge on Abaco Island in the Bahamas, Oliver White is kidnapped and terrorized for 12 hours before escaping. Now, the future of the lodge and the partnership with billionaire Bill Ackman is in jeopardy. Did what happen to you on the island when you were kidnapped or abducted, um, did it change you? Yeah, it's materially changed my, my general trusting nature. I am definitely more aware of people in my surroundings and a little less trusting and, uh, you know, and it impacts a lot of other decisions in life. You know, I pay way more attention to just security risk, uh, not only at my personal home when I travel, when I go places and things. So I'm definitely more cognizant of just what's going on. Did you ever just want to say, screw it, I'm packing it up yeah, and going yeah. home, this place is not for me? <laughs> no, I mean, right after I got kidnapped, I uh, got on a plane, left, and, uh, you know, obviously, at that time, wasn't coming back. And Bill said, you know, the money is not important. He's like, and I'll, I'll make you whole and we'll go find another one. And uh, so I had an out. I mean, I, ha I had the ability to walk away and, uh, you know, ha have the money that I'd put in returned and have someone willing to help me do another one. That was a tempting offer. I mean, part of me said, that's perfect, let's just move on. But, you know, ultimately, w what happened was a random event. You know, I quickly learned and, and was very comfortable in that, you know, it wasn't a targeted act, it was just a random, crazy guy. And really, the conclusion was just that. I mean, what, what happened was a freak event. I mean, it's the only kidnapping in the history of the island. It just doesn't happen, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the property is so great, and the resource is so great, and I had so much confidence in what it was going to be to throw that all away because of one bad experience just wasn't the right answer. It really just wasn't the right thing to do. Oliver persevered, returning to the islands to finish construction. And by partnering with Nervous Waters, Oliver has created a first-class fishing lodge. The lodge itself feels very remote. You, you feel like you're on your, your own private island. We're right on the morals. Um, you don't have to trailer to get out to your fishery each day. The, the boats are right at the dock. You finish your breakfast, you, you run out, you hop on your boat, and you're, you're on a great fishing ground within 20 minutes or so and you're aggressively going into your day and seeing tailing bones. I mean, there, there's nothing better. But then when you come back to the lodge, we have wonderful five-star service. Uh, we have an incredible chef. The food is something that's commented on a regular basis. It, it just overwhelms and surprises people. And five-star accommodations for you to, to relax and enjoy. My, my goal was to to build something that I wanted to be a part of, right? So I, I really, it's important for me for the place to feel like home. I don't want it to feel like a hotel, I want it to feel like it's a home. After successfully managing the lodge himself for the first few years, Oliver brought in Ann and Ken Perkinson to continue the high level of service at Abaco Lodge. It's, it's meant to be an upscale experience, but we want you to feel comfortable enough to, to come to the dinner table barefoot if you want to. You're in the islands and we want this to become a second home, and I think that makes us stand apart. We live here year-round, so we bring people into our home, and um, it's as if you're a guest in our home, and that's the way I want you to feel. But a fishing lodge can only be as successful as the fishing, and Abaco Lodge has that in abundance. The morals is just an unprecedented fishery. I don't, I've never seen, nor I know of, a, a bone fishery that has the density of bonefish and the quality of fishing that is so consistent day in, day out, every month of the year. <laughs> and, and on top of that, there's no one there. I mean, you have, you, you, there, it, it's unbelievable that it's- well, We've been here for two weeks and we've never seen another boat. Yeah. Coming up, with a hugely successful lodge built, Oliver continues to look overseas for fishing opportunities. After building a world-class fishing lodge on the island of Abaco in the Bahamas, Oliver White is currently searching for a location for a new lodge and continues to volunteer in conservation activities. You know, I think part of being an angler necessitates you're a conservationist. I mean, you, you have to protect what you, what you love. And recently, Oliver has been a part of a fishing project in Guyana. There's a, there's a village there. It's the most remote indigenous village in the country. And throughout Guyana, all, all the indigenous people are, are just now getting into the modern world of needing money. And so the only resource and skill they really have is their land. The majority of the indigenous people are selling the timber rights. So they're 
cutting down the rainforest or selling the mining rights and digging for gold, which they're still doing in open pit mercury mines. It's a disaster. And this village was the most remote and they were ahead of the curve and they just decided that it wasn't the answer. They were looking for what the answer was. And it happens that they have the world's largest scale freshwater fish, the arapaima, which doesn't really exist. They've been harvested to extinction. And we went down there and made a documentary on the ability to catch them on fly. And Oliver has donated his time pays for his ticket to go down there, and they have turned this lodge, because it was a, a sustainable business, they helped this village of 280 people whose annual income was $750, and now their annual income is 40000 The village owns the business in its entirety. Uh, the fish are protected, so we negotiate with the government to give them special privileges to be allowed to do fly fishing, catch and release fishing in the village, and it's an incredible home run. And the direct result is the village is a better place, but also their, their entire piece of rainforest is now protected, which is just a spectacular story of how fly fishing can really make the world a better place. Oliver is going to, to save the world by teaching everyone how to fish. With everything Oliver has achieved and everything he has built, there's still one thing he's never done. All right, Clint, 30 feet and downwind. That's what we need. Such a layup that I even I can't f it up. I'm gonna experiment with Clint's globster here, see if it'll work. 11 o'clock, yeah, it's got him. And this could be the fish, the permit that breaks the lifelong curse. You got him. That's the permit. You got him. Dude, he's spooked Perfect. and he crushed your lobster bag. Good job, Oliver. <laughs> Good job. But I've been here before. <laughs> I understand. So I fished literally all over the world, man. I've caught almost everything that I've ever wanted to catch, and there is one thing that continually oh, evades me, and that's a permit. I can't tell you how many permit I've cast to, how many shots I've had, and how many countries. I mean, I've hooked permit. I've cast probably to hundreds at this point. Man, there is a permit curse like no other that rests on my shoulders. Permit are a difficult fish for anyone. Uh, you can do everything right a hundred times, it just doesn't matter. You can do everything wrong and it works. Uh, and I think, in my case, now we've had years of failure. The the adrenaline gets kicking, and it just has made it worse, right? I mean, now it's just your heart starts pounding, and 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 you and you get the shakes. And you're defeated before you ever make a cast. And that ability to just relax and, and throw, which normally comes so intuitively, com completely disappears. <laughs> I'm a little nervous at the moment, man. I just uh... <laughs> jump on him. <laughs> After a great battle, all we have to do is bring it to the boat. God damn it. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I can't believe that. Oh, where'd it come this? I don't know, man. Oh, man, that's tough. <laughs> The funny thing is, I could have touched that leader, and I didn't because I didn't want it to break. I had the leader in the rod tip, but yeah. still, man. <laughs> could have done anything different, man. I thought we were, I thought it was over. You just turned him, too. Just turned him. That, that's brutal, man. I, I, I swear, that is how my permit fishing has gone. Well, there's lots of permit here. Let's get you one. Let's yeah. see what happens. Let's get it. 